Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to my presentation, Axonal Protein Synthesis in New Development in Degeneration. My name is Ulrich Hengst. I'm an assistant professor of pathology and cell biology, working in the Taub Institute for Research on Alzheimer's Disease and the Aging Brain here at Columbia University in New York. If you think about how our understanding of a cell is being formed, and if you check any uh, standard textbook um, about cell biology, you will probably come across a picture just like this. A cell is uh, depicted as a small, roundish entity without really much spatial differentiation. However, in reality, cells are tot look totally different, and you will have a hard time of finding such a round cell. Even in relatively simple organisms, such as yeast cells or fibroblasts, you will find differentiation in uh, daughter and mother cells or in a leading edge or a trailing edge, whereas in uh, organisms you have apical to basal specification. The spatial and morphological differentiation of cells is nowhere more um, pronounced than in neurons, where you have uh, a vast difference between dendrites and axons. All of this then leads to the question how gene expression is regulated in the spatial um, dimension. Of course, the standard answer to this is that mRNAs are translated into proteins somewhere in the cell body, and the localization signal leads to the transport of the proteins into the periphery of the cell. However, more recently, and this should be the focus of this talk, it has come to um, our knowledge that mRNAs, most of the time the 3' UTRs of mRNAs, contain cis-acting elements that drive transport of mRNAs into the periphery of cells, and only within the periphery of the cells, in a single dependent manner, most of the time, the mRNA is being translated in a just-in-time uh, just in place fashion to give rise of differences in protein expression across the cell. All of these, these processes um, are part of the post transcription regulation of gene expression that is, as, uh, in my view, as important as transcription regulation of gene expression. Once you have an mRNA being transcribed, within the nucleus it's being processed. Um, processing might be, for example, splicing. After processing of the mRNA it is being exported into the nuclear, into the cytoplasm, and a different set, partially overlapping set of transacting factors of proteins bind to the mRNA. They together regulate, for example, the stability, but also the transport and eventually the translation of the mRNA. All of these individual steps together um, lead to spatial temporal control of gene expression. Most of the cis-acting elements, as I said before, that regulate processing, transport, stability, and translation of mRNA, at least in mammalian cells, are encoded in the three prime untranslated regions of the cells, of the mRNA. We have, throughout evolutions, many examples uh, for mRNA localization, even in the most um, simple, in the simplest organism, such as E. coli or yeast, as I mentioned, mRNAs are being transported and single dependently translated. For example, H1 mRNA in budding yeast that is being transported into the budding daughter cell. More and very extensive mRNA localization is known from Drosophila and from Xenopus oocyte, but also in fish and uh, mammalian cells, mRNA localization is very pronounced. Fairly recently, work has found that, for example, lamellipodia or fibroblasts are enriched in a specific uh, subset of mRNAs that are anchored to the tips of, the mRNA, uh, of microtubules. The so focus of the talk today is mRNA localization in neurons, 
mainly developing neurons, but uh, shortly also uh, adult neurons. Um, and just for completeness sake, um, also other cells in the nervous system, such as oligodendrocytes, contain uh, extensive uh, mRNA lo uh, localization. As I had said on the, in the very beginning, neurons are extremely polarized. We all know this. We have a, a dendritic elaboration um, that can take many shapes and forms. Here are some examples given. And every neuron contains exactly one axon. The axon is separated from the somatodendritic compartment through the axon hillock. This uh, acts as a diffusion barrier, meaning that there is no uh, that there is very little passive transport or diffusion of components from the smaller than the component into the axons. Meaning that mRNAs that are found in axons are there because of an active transport mechanism. Importantly to note is also that axonal and dendritic mRNA uh, composition is completely different and the axonal transcriptomes are distinct and separate in both of their complexity and composition from the somatodendritic transcriptome. One of the most important or uh, striking features for a cell biologist looking at uh, an axon is a vast difference in uh, size. A classical cell body of a neuron is something like 20 to 50 microns in diameter, whereas an axon can spend, uh, can easily reach up to one meter or three feet in uh, dimension. And to bring this a little bit more in, uh, in the macroscopic scale, if we would understand that uh, a neuron cell body is, has the same, di is um, a baseball, baseball having a diameter of 74 millimeter, an axon on this scale would span roughly uh, 5,000 feet. I think this brings sort of um, to mind the vast difference in scale between axons and um, cell bodies and also leads to a couple of questions because normally we do not understand new uh, cells to be macroscopically large such as one meter. For example, one question that arises from the uh, vast distance of an axon is how is material bio, uh, how are proteins being transported into the periphery? We know very well how fast proteins can be transported. This is mainly uh, done through experiments using um, radioactive amino acids uh, given specifically to the cell body and then uh, testing after certain time intervals where the radioactively labeled proteins show up. And so we know by now that there are different uh, speeds of axonal transport. For example, anterograde transport is relatively quick with a rate of uh, 200 to 400 millimeters a day. And I have given here on the side um, the, the time it would roughly take to um, travel a one meter axon with this transport speed. So for anterograde transport, it's not so bad, it's 2.5 days. Um, however, a lot of these transport, this anterograde transport that, uh, of the fast um, nature is specific for membrane proteins and lipids, whereas a lot of other proteins, especially proteins that make up the cytoskeleton, are transported far slower, and here transport can take several months. So this is a problem that we hardly ever think about because we don't think about that proteins are very stable for this time. And I'm not saying that uh, within this um, talk, I have an answer to, uh, to all of these problems that arise from the slow transport speed. But suffice to say that relatively early, um, it has been recognized that slow transport within an axon and the vast distances that uh, a single neuron can spend uh, will will force us to maybe adapt our understanding about basic cell biology. In fact, already very early on, in 1899, um, Llewellyn Barker hypothesized in his book about the uh, nervous system that it might be that the axon would actually not receive all of its nutrient material from the ganglion cell, meaning the cell body, 
but rather, as would seem a priori much more likely, receive uh, part of its material uh, through an autochthonous metabolism. So in um, slightly more modern terms, he already in 1899 posed the question whether exons are able to synthesize proteins. And if I speak with undergraduate students or with uh, lay people, they don't seem to have much of a problem with this concept. However, the more progressed in science um, my uh, counterparts are, the more arguments they have against the existence of local translation in exons, mainly because it, uh, it seems to go against several dogma uh, that we um, hold dear. And so this is really a very old debate. Um, already in 1893, when uh, Karl Schaffer did his um, uh, staining for Nissel's substance, meaning for RNA-rich structures, he identified for each cell one process um, that turned out to be the exon that is devoid of any Nissel stain, meaning being devoid of RNA. However, already in 1943, um, RNA was detected in embryonic exons. And this is an important point. While Karl Schaffer had looked at adult neurons, um, in this paper, embryonic exons were being studied. And clearly, embryonic exons contain uh, RNA according to the data from 1943. However, the, uh, in 1955, um, again, a very uh, influential article uh, found that there are absolutely no ribonuclear proteins detectable in the exoplasm, but again, the authors of the study looked at adult exons. Um, in 1960, in a quite elegant experiment, dogs were being subjected to um, poisonous substance that uh, irreversibly inhibits acetylcholine esterase. And the authors checked in nerve segments where does acetylcholine esterase um, activity reemerges. And what they found is that independent of where along the length of an axon you look, acetylcholine esterase activity just appears exact, at exactly the same time. So this can't be, um, or this seems to be co uh, contradictory to the idea that the protein is produced in the cell body and then untergradely transported along the axons. The conclusion that um, Koenig and Kölle um, proposed at the time is that acetylcholine esterase is being produced locally. In 1970, Virginia Tennyson then uh, provided direct evidence for the existence of polyribosomes in, again, developing axons, not mature axons, by EM. And the field um, got uh, a lot of more uh, dynamic around the turn of the um, century uh, when Gary Bassell identified the first mRNA to be localized to growth cones and axons. Uh, mainly beta actin. You can see here uh, a strong fish signal in an individual um, neuroid, being the axon. And finally, in 2001, Christine Holt's group from Cambridge published a very influential neuron article, uh, to which I will refer in a little bit, in which she presented for the first time direct evidence that local translation in axons is required for axon development. A couple of years later, um, we then found um, the first specific mRNA A that is required for a specific growth cone behavior, growth cone collapse, in response to semaphore in 3A. However, just to be um, uh, very uh, open about it, the debate is not yet settled. For example, in 2009, Paul Letourneau published an article in the Journal of Neuroscience uh, in which he finds that protein synthesis in distal axons is not required for growth cone responses. And so the whole um, the scientific discussion about this question goes on. But I think that by now, I think the overhanging evidence argues that local translation within axons is important for development of axons and uh, possibly also for maintenance and degeneration and certainly for regeneration. So coming back to the original uh, findings from Christine Holt, um, she 
studied exon pathfinding and um, growth cone behavior in response to um, neuronal guidance cues. During the development, the exons of, uh, have to go through really complicated uh, paths with the developing nervous system, and they are being helped by attractive and repulsive guidance cues. You can um, sort these guidance cues further into secreted long-range cues, such as the natrin semaphorins that can be both um, attractive and repulsive, or contact, um, meaning cell surface um, guidance cues, such as afferents, um, cadherins, and so on. In Christine Holt's approach, she used retinal, um, exon, uh, retinal explants from Xenopus. And in this explants, it is possible to cut the cell bodies so that only the exons, as shown here, stay behind. And such a cut exon will stay alive and we continue to grow and to react to extracellular guidance cues for several hours. So now if you, for example, apply natrin in a 45 degree angle to one of these cut axons, and keep in mind there is no cell body around anymore, the axon will, uh, will react by turning away from the source of natrin. If you do this with quite a lot of axons, you find uh, that the average turning angle is negative. However, if Christine Holt applied anisomycin, a protein translation inhibitor, exons didn't care about the natrin um, gradient anymore at all, and you have no bias for a turning angle at all anymore. The same was true not only with, um, uh, with anisomycin, but also with cyclohexamide, another um, protein translation inhibitor. And because the cell bodies have been cut away, whatever is being inhibited here in terms of translation has to be uh, necessarily local translation. Based on this experiment and many other experiments, she developed the following um, uh, signaling pathway where both semaphorin 3A and natrin lead to the activation of uh, translation local protein synthesis, and protein synthesis then affects in some way the cytoskeleton, leading to negative uh, to repulsion or growth cone collapse. However, at the time it was not known which proteins are being synthesized, both in response to semaphorin or to natrin, and uh, mediate local uh, growth cone um, changes in growth cone behavior. Um, I hope you can still see me. I got a little um, blackout here. Okay, so I'm, I'm going on. Um, at this time, then, we started investigating which mRNAs might be locally translated. And based on the um, growth con collapse and retraction uh, phenotype, we speculated that the small GTPAs might be involved, and we focused on row A. Um, and indeed, doing, uh, using in situ hybridization, meaning a staining uh, specific for mRNA, we could identify that both um, beta actin, but also rho A, were heavily localized to exons. The GAP43 is a counter staining, whereas ROC or RAC mRNAs were totally absent. The same result can be also seen here in RT-PCR, uh, made on uh, exonal or whole cell uh, libraries. So now that we knew that rho A mRNA was around, we wanted to have a way of directly proving that rho A mRNA is locally translated in a semaphorin 3A dependent manner. For this, we designed um, or we used a viral reporter system originally developed by Aaron Schumann's group, in which we have a membrane bound, destabilized EGFP. The MERS TILTEC 
means that the, produce, the EGFP cannot diffuse because it is bound to the membrane. The destabilization gives us the half-life of just a couple of uh, minutes, something like half an hour. And we overexpress this mRNA in the context of the 3' UTR, the 3' untranslated region of rho A. The idea behind this is that now destabilized membrane-bound EGFP is being translated uh, in exactly the same manner in which endogenous rho A mRNA is being translated. And indeed, if you look at this uh, phase contrast images, here you see the EGFP signal. Uh, you see that there are a couple of EGFP positive spots. This means this is where within the last half an hour this construct has been translated. If we stimulate now with 60, uh, for 60 minutes with semaphore and 3A in this axon, you see that many, many more and brighter um, of these hotspots appear. We can quantify this by doing this dot plots. In control uh, conditions, this is in the blue color, um, the intensity and the number of the um, hotspots doesn't really change. However, with semaphore and 3A, you get a lot of new hotspots of M uh, rho A expression, and most of them are above the, 40, the um, dividing line, meaning the intensity goes up. So semaphore and 3A induces translation of rho A, but is rho A translation required for the effect of semaphore and 3A? For this, we can use compartmentalized chamber, in this case, a company chamber, where we place cell bodies here in the central compartment and the axons go to both sides in the side compartments. Um, we established that it is possible to use siRNA against mRNA specifically in the side compartments. The si will lead to a knockdown of the mRNA only in axons without being retrogradely transported to the cell bodies. In this way, we can establish a, a condition in which neurons um, contain no rho A siRNA anymore, no rho A mRNA anymore in their axons. And if we do this, you see that semaphore and 3A absolutely fails to induce growth cone collapse, whereas a control siRNA uh, obviously does not uh, lead to suppression of semaphore and phenotype. So with this experiment, we can show that local rho A mRNA is required for semaphore and 3A. But the question is whether rho A mRNA alone is sufficient for semaphore and 3A induced growth cone collapse. For this, we have to establish a condition in which uh, all other mRNAs that are present in axons are not being translated with the exception of rho A. We used here a molecular biology trick uh, by overexpressing rho A in the context of an iOS internal ribosome entry site containing construct. If we just overexpress this construct, it has no effect on the, on the rate of growth cone collapse in response to semaphore in 3A. It is still around 70 to 80 um, percent. If we completely inhibit local translation, uh, local translation with anisomycin, you see that growth cone collapse is completely abolished. However, if we use another translational inhibitor, rapamycin, rapamycin does not in, uh, inhibit growth cone collapse in response to SEMA3A. And the difference is that while anisomycin inhibits all kinds of uh, translation, rapamycin inhibits only cap-dependent translation. And our construct here for rho A does not contain a cap, but an iris as an initiation site. Therefore, rapamycin is unable to inhibit the, tra the translation of rho A of this construct. So we create indeed a situation in which only rho A is being locally produced, no other mRNA yields protein, and yet we find semi-dependent growth cone collapse, meaning that local translation of rho A alone is sufficient for uh, semi-induced growth cone collapse. So this all together leads then to um, the, this model for the first identified um, mRNA that has to be locally translated in response to uh, SEMA signaling. Um, 
Obviously, raw A production alone is not sufficient because as a small GTPase it has to be activated and then it leads to rock activation and gross con collapse and axon retraction. However, curiously, different extracellular guidance cues do essentially the same trick um, by causing the local translation of different mRNAs. For example, SLID2 also leads to gross con collapse. And this is again work by Christine Holt's group. She uses the same approach here with um, her severed axons. Um, you see here a control gross cone that will collapse if you apply SLID2. Um, and the collapse is not inhibited by inhibiting uh, transcription, but it is inhibited by anisomycin and cyclohexamide protein synthesis inhibitors. So again, SLID2 requires local translation and it leads to uh, local protein synthesis. In this case, it is not raw A that is, do, that is being locally translated, but cofilin mRNA. Cofilin mRNA is heavily localized to axons and gross cones. And upon application of SLID2, you see that the protein levels go heavily up, um, but not and obviously anisomycin and cyclohexamide lead, um, even though the mRNA is around, uh, prevent the increase of uh, cofilin protein. So this leads to the uh, rather puzzling um, question, why would different transcription factors, the, uh, different guidance cues lead to the local translation of different proteins that have similar effects? In a follow-up study, we asked the question, which are the proteins or the protein that is locally translated that would um, support exon growth and um, lead to growth con elaboration as opposed to uh, retraction. And we focused here on the um, CDC 42 par 3 par 6 polarity complex, um, it, mainly because it is a master regulator of cellular polarity. Um, and directly uh, affects the cytoskeleton. And in many instances, such as C. elegans zygotes or um, epithelial cells, but also um, neurons, it was uh, found that the complex is specifically localized to certain regions of the um, cell, in the case of neurons specifically to the um, tip of an axon. And so we asked whether any of the mRNAs making, uh, of the proteins making up this complex might be localized to exons. And indeed, we found that PAR3 mRNA, the mRNA coding for the um, central uh, part of this complex, is indeed heavily localized um, to exons. By heavily localized, um, you have to take my word for it and believe your computer screen that there actually is a signal. Uh, but you can also look here at the quantification. Rho A and PAR3 mRNA are roughly uh, equally expressed and uh, confirmed by RT-PCR. We then wanted to um, establish whether or not the PAR complex is indeed required for exon growth. For this, we uh, prepared an ex vivo assay where we take embryonic red spinal cord and do an open book preparation. So we cut along the dorsal part of the spinal cord segment and flip the, um, the spinal cord open and then electroporate GFP together with siRNA into the dorsal half of uh, this open book preparation. And then after 48 hours, we can see the cell bodies labeled and the axons going towards the midline crossing and um, turning. So this is how it looks in reality. You see here the cell bodies, the commercial cell bodies, the axons go towards the midline and turn. If we overexpress a control as iRNA, again, cell bodies labeled, axons labeled, they go and turn. If we knock down PAR3 or PAR6, um, axons fail to, be, to go towards the, the midline or to reach the midline. They still grow, but they grow much, much slower. You can see here a couple of these axons. So this led us to speculate, and indeed, uh, um, 
the park complex is required for attractive growth uh, towards the midline. And this could mean that, for example, part three might be locally translated. We um, used a compartmentalized uh, culturing system to which I will uh, come back in a little bit um, to directly prove that part three is locally translated. So our idea is that NGF leads to local translation among the parts, uh, parts we might be locally translated. So we just applied NGF locally and measured growth speed of over a one hour period. Quantified here, NGF leads to an increase in growth speed. However, if we locally apply parts three as iRNA, all other mRNAs are still intact. Exons completely fail to react with increased growth speeds in uh, to NGF, meaning that the activity of uh, the mechanism by which NGF induces exon growth involves local translation of PAR3. So this then led to the uh, model for um, attractive or role for, of local translation in attractive growth that natrin binds to its receptor leads to local translation of PAR3 that then leads to the nucleation of the PAR complex that you can see here and you get in effect um, Exxon outgoes and cytoskeletal dynamics. So these were now a couple of examples that came together over the year that all follow essentially the same system that you have um, exon guidance cues up here that lead to local translation of some mRNAs that then have effects that are either attractive or repulsive. Um, what is far, uh, far worse and or far less understood is how precisely the regulation happens, um, meaning how does binding of a ligand lead to local translation of very specific mRNAs. One idea um, is based on a paper from 2010 by uh, John Flanagan's group who found that ribosomes or ribosomal subunits such as a 40S and 60S subunit uh, and uh, ribosomal in initiation factors can bind directly to the cytosolic uh, domains of um, ligand uh, of uh, guidance Q receptors such as DCC, leading to the idea that up and binding of, in this case, netrin, the ribosomes are being released locally leading to the um, local translation of mRNAs that are present in, present in RNPs. For other M, uh, systems, um, we know a little bit about, for example, that phosphorylation of the zip code binding protein is important for the activation of beta-actin translation. Um, we know that other mRNAs are regulated through um, different proteins such as CBP. In general, it seems to be that local that binding of an um, extracellular signal leads to a local signal transduction cascade that oftentimes involves uh, kinases that then lead uh, to very specific local translation of mRNAs. The mRNAs, on the other hand, are being transported uh, in very specific granules, meaning complexes between transacting factors and mRNAs in a um, kinesin-dependent manner into the axons. And while they're being transported, they're being si uh, translationally silenced, and they, pre they wait for the signal in the periphery to be locally translated. So we know all this, and it allows us now to um, summarize a little bit what we have learned over the last 15 years or so. Most of the work, as I said, has been done in embryonic axons during development where we by now have a very good understanding that uh, guidance cues, cues lead to local translation of cytoskeletal proteins, but also signaling molecules such as CREP1 that then together lead to axon pass finding but also exon branching in the case of uh, beta-actin, for example, possibly synapse formation. So this is all on the embryonic side. And as I said during uh, the, the part of the talk where I talked about the 
long debate whether or not axonal translation is happening at all. The situation in adult neurons seems to be fairly different. This is mainly a, um, evidenced by the fact that there, in adult axons there is certainly far fewer mRNA abundance and we have problems detecting any local translation at all. So the debate right now is going on whether adult axons at all are able to, uh, to produce proteins locally. However, recently, again, Christine Holt's group has shown that Lamin B2 is locally translated in axons and is required for um, activity of mitochondrial proteins. If you don't have the local translation of Lamin B2, axon maintenance is greatly impaired. So this is the first interesting hint at um, a role of local translation in more mature axons. Clearly, once you injure an axon, and this is mainly work by uh, Mike Feinsilber and Jeffrey Twiss and others, you will find rapid reactivation or activation of local translation, um, a very specific and distinct set of mRNAs is being uh, recruited into the axons and you have local translation of both nuclear factors but also cytoskeletal proteins together this um, local translation in response to nerve injury is uh, required for um, regrowth or the attempts of regrowth of uh, axons and the transcriptomes that have been uh, identified of injured axons contain many cytoskeletal and injury response um, proteins meaning that uh, there is hope that maybe interference with uh, local translation after nerve injury might be a way of helping axons to regenerate. What we don't know in any of these instances is why is local translation here preferred as opposed to transport from, of the proteins from the cell body. Further, we have no, at, at given, no understanding whether new degeneration, um, meaning very old axons, uh, might reactivate local translation as well. And this is really the, um, uh, these are the two questions that uh, we follow in my own group here at Columbia quite a bit. So what do I mean that we don't know much about the rationale? I started with the um, slow transport of uh, mRNAs into the periphery and uh, one could argue that this is uh, justification enough. However, if one looks a little bit more closely, you will find that only 4.8% and this is give or take obviously of all transcripts are found in growth counts. This means that it's a minority of the whole of the whole cellular transcriptome is localized, and even for mRNAs that are localized, for example, in the case of actin, uh, beta actin, and tubulin, less than one percent of the actin and tubulin in axons is actually locally synthesized. Ninety-nine percent come from the cell body, so it is very difficult to understand that transport is efficient enough for ninety-nine percent but not for 100%. So transport efficiency probably really isn't the reason why local translation uh, exists. Further, we have absolutely no correlation between protein function size or uh, characteristic and the question whether or not they are locally translated. So it remains an open question why in some instances, but in many other instances, um, not local translation is being used and I came to believe that there simply isn't anything like a general explanation for uh, local protein synthesis and that we have to look more precisely at each individual instance to find a solution why local translation might be more uh, advantageous here. And in the following couple of slides I want to give you an example for um, how we think about this. So our hypothesis was that local translation might be uniquely suited to integrate two seemingly uh, separate pathways that always have to happen at the same time in the same place. And our example system here was again axon outgrowth. I talked before uh, that um, attractive guidance cues such as Netrin on um, uh, commercial axons or NGF on DRG axons uh, 
need local translation of PAR3 that then leads to the PAR complex for attractive uh, axonal elongation. However, if you think about what must happen within an axon for rapid axon outgrowth, it is clearly not only the site of skeleton, but you also have to have a lot of membrane expansion. And so we were wondering how is membrane expansion tightly, both spatially and temporally, uh, synchronized with uh, cytoskeletal dynamics. So the question is, is local translation maybe a connecting link between these two seemingly parallel pathways? In this, uh, in, in this uh, if this hypothesis is right, uh, we would have a linear pathway that leads to activation of local translation of pivotal proteins in both of the following pathways. And because they are being locally translated at the same time in the same place, both the membrane expansion, the cytoskeletal dynamics pathway would kick in necessarily always in a synchronized fashion. So to look at this, we of course first have to know how the membrane is being expanded during attractive outgrowth. And surprisingly for us, um, membrane is added more or less exclusively within the growth cone. So um, membrane, uh, plasma membrane precursor vesicles, PPVs, are being produced from the Golgi in the cell body and then transported along the axons into the growth cone. And here in the EM, you see these PPVs as this round structures that then are being tethered to the membrane and fused with the membrane to enlarge the membrane. This uh, we can visualize this by using a, a fluorescent membrane uh, marker, body PFL C5 ceramide. And the interesting um, physical, biophysical property of body PFL uh, C5 ceramide is that at very, very high concentrations, such as you can achieve only in the Golgi, it will form intracellular excimers at fluorescence red, whereas normally it is green. This leads to the uh, fact that the PPVs are all the plasma membrane precursor vesicles are labeled red, whereas the cell, the, um, cell surface is labeled green. Now, if we induce membrane expansion, we will see fusion of PPVs to the, extracell to the plasma membrane by disappearance of this labeled uh, PPVs in the red channel. And indeed, this is what we then test in our microfluidic chambers that allow us to seed uh, neurons specifically to one side of these uh, microfluidic dividers. The microfluidic dividers are uh, microgrooves that are 10 microns or 20 microns wide and 3 microns high. And in this case, it might be 200 or 500 microns long. Um, Due to hydrostatic differences, there is no exchange between the axonal and the cell body side, so that we can apply NGF or any kind, whatever we want, essentially, selectively to axons without interfering with the cell bodies. So we do this here in the system. Again, we um, have the cell bodies on one side of the dividers, and we treat the axons only on the other side of the divider. We load our cell bodies with our membrane dye, and you see here the um, control situation, a lot of um, red staining. Up in stimulation, the red staining totally disappears due to the, few, uh, due to the secretion of this uh, plasma membrane precursor vesicles with a membrane. If we locally apply anisomycin or cyclohexamide or emetine, we uh, structurally unrelated protein translation inhibitors, you see that we get a complete inhibition of the lack of uh, membrane expansion. So membrane expansion requires local translation. The question is, of course, what is being locally translated? And so we looked into the cell biology of um, PPV um, tethering to the membrane followed by fusion. And the tethering process is being mediated by a uh, protein complex called the exocyst, containing uh, uh, eight different exocyst proteins and the small GTPA is called TC10. And interesting enough, both a component of the exocyst called SEC6 and TC10 itself had been previously described uh, by various groups to be part of uh, axonal tran uh, transcriptomes.
So we asked whether either or, or both of these proteins might be locally synthesized and mediate local translation. We actually couldn't reproduce the uh, SEC6 XOC3 localization. However, we saw that TC10 is heavily localized both to exons, both by RT-PCR and by FISH. And the standard experiment, again, if we, um, we, we looked for t local TC10 fluorescence, um, immune fluorescence levels, and we saw that um, up in NGF stimulation, it goes up quite a bit. However, if we inhibit translation by locally applying anisomycin or cyclohexamide, there is no significant increase. And if we use TC10 as iRNA, there also is no increase in response to NGF. So TC10 is locally synthesized, but is it required for NGF-induced exonal elongation? So here again, we do an exon outgrowth assay over one hour as before for part three, and TC10 as iRNA completely, it's down here, completely abolishes growth in response to NGF. And the same is true for our body PSA. If we use TC10 as iRNA locally, we do not see fusion of the PPVs with the membrane. So this together leads to um, the following uh, uh, single transduction cascades at attractive guidance cues such as NGF lead to an activation of PS3 kinase because if we use a PS3 kinase inhibitor such as Wartmanin, we interfere with the uh, with, uh, production of both TC10 and PAS3. Um, the same is true for FTI-227, a rep inhibitor, or direct rep knockdown, or for rapamycin. So we get this linear cascade that attractive guidance cues lead to activation of PS3 kinase, ACT, TSC2, rep, mTOR, and protein synthesis of both PAS3 and TC10. And this is exactly what we had hypothesized originally. So we now for the example of this two mRNAs, we have a better understanding why local translation might be preferred. And we believe indeed that local translation integrates both membrane expansion and cytoskeletal dynamics leading to uh, external elongation. Um, in the last slide of this talk, I really would like to very quickly talk about um, a potential for external translation and uh, neurodegeneration, and I refer to it already, this is uh, Christine Holt's work, in which she showed that extrinsic cues um, lead to local translation of Lamin B2. And surprisingly, Lamin B2 that is not, or up to now, had been mainly understood to be uh, a protein of the nucleus or the, the nuclear lamina and the um, nuclear envelope, is locally required for uh, mitochondrial fitness. If local translation of Lamin B2 is inhibited, she finds mitochondrial dysfunction followed by exon degeneration. And this is extremely um, tantalizing now because axonopathy is part of many, many uh, neurodegenerative disorders. And it leads us to speculate and to actively investigate whether maybe local axonal translation is being impacted in neurodegenerative disorders and whether changes in axonal transcriptome or local proteome are part of um, pathogenic pathways leading to um, neurodegeneration. So in summary, um, over the last uh, two decades or so, we have learned that developing exons certainly, and for mature exons it is still um, an open question, contain mRNAs and protein translational machinery, and a distinct subset of mRNAs is recruited into exons um, in a situation-dependent manner. For example, I mentioned uh, injured or regenerating exons that contain a different subset of mRNAs and developing exons. and these mRNAs are locally translated most often in a single dependent manner and affect for short periods of time the exonally localized transcriptome. And based on transcriptome analysis so far, uh, 
a picture emerges in which many of the localized mRNAs code for proteins with function in protein synthesis itself, like ribosomal subunits, and proteins that regulate cytoskeleton and intracellular signaling. However, the deeper we sequence, and we're using RNA-seq, for example, uh, this view might change, and we find many, many more cellular functions that are represented in the exonal transcriptomes. So coming back to the original question, why is there local translation happening at all? One, one uh, possible explanation is just in time, just in place delivery. Certainly single amplification, we find a lot of singling molecules. Um, in the case of synapses, a, a very nice idea is a tagging of subcellular domains, so you can uh, deliver proteins very, very specifically to uh, micro domains. There is a possibility that uh, locally translated proteins have distinct properties due to, um, for example, selective uh, post-translation modification. And I think um, that we provide evidence that local translation can lead to the integration of seemingly uh, unconnected parallel pathways that always have to happen in tight synchrony. Let me finish by acknowledging um, the people in my group who did this work. Uh, Nilia Gracious, Remina Baliora, uh, Chandler, Joe, Jose, and Toure, uh, our collaborators at Cornell, and finally, the funding agencies who make all of this possible. And finally, if you're interested in CME, here's the address. I'm now going to click on the questions uh, that came in during my talk. And I have here a question. Uh, it seems likely that the question is, um, oops, I forgot. Uh, I lo okay, it seems that most examples you bring up of local axonal translation involve translation of actin cytoskeletal machinery. Uh, other neuronal proteins like acetylcholine receptors also expressed regulated this way. Okay. Um, so the answer for this is that many examples of the best studied uh, mRNAs that are locally translated so far are indeed um, cytoskeletal proteins or, or regulators of the cytoskeleton. However, we are now understanding that many other pro uh, a lot of other proteins and other protein classes are regulated in the same way. In terms of acetylcholine receptors, it's um, still not quite understood whether receptors at all can be locally translated. We find mRNAs for receptors. However, we do not see Golgi. The Golgi apparatus is clearly not present in axons. So we have then to ask the question, how is the secretory pathway uh, functioning in the periphery. There are some indications that there are Golgi-like structures and Golgi-like functionality in the periphery in axons. However, the uh, final functional proof has not yet been uh, made. And so, in the end, we don't know whether, for example, acetylcholine receptor is regulated uh, through local translation. I have another question here, um, whether the HPA axis has any influence on axonal protein synthesis. And to my knowledge, this question has not yet um, uh, been addressed experimentally at all. Um, also, a lot of the research on axonal translation is still on the level of um, uh, in vitro research, meaning um, primary cultures mainly, and we are just now developing the tools um, to go into living animals to ask questions such as this that would apply more on a um, whole organ, organism level. There is another question that um, uh, asks, there are few there is few evidence that suggests that myelin debris might be taken up as a neuronal soma. Um, 
can I throw some light on whether it's being whether it's being metabolized or whether this. Okay, so the question here uh, relates to um, some fairly, uh, over the last couple of years, there are a couple of um, indications that uh, there might be horizontal transfer of material from uh, glia cells or from uh, Schwann cells, for example, to the axon. And um, of course, this is a very uh, nice idea that maybe RNA can be transferred directly and being taken up. However, it hasn't really been proven to have any um, physiological relevance as of yet. Um, another question is, uh, in growth cones, there are a lot of ribosomal protein mRNAs and translational proteins, such as EIF4E or EIF4G. Why do I think that uh, growth cones might need to synthesize ribosomes locally? So this is a great question. Um, in any transcriptome that you do on axons, you will find uh, ribosomal subunits, either proteins or uh, RNAs, to be overrepresented. And what we think that it is something like a feed forward mechanism. Um, you have originally, you start out with very few localized ribosomes, but then, for example, up a nerve crush or injury or stimulation in any other way, you get first an amplification of the uh, translational uh, or protein synthesis machinery that is localized, and then you get a lot of other pro uh, proteins uh, produced from locally produced ribosomes. So the presence of um, or the existence of ribosomal protein mRNAs within um, uh, growth cones, I think, is an indication that uh, they give the possibility for rapid amplification of the uh, protein synthesis ability. Um, I'm clicking through more questions. So at the moment, I do not see any more questions than the ones that I have answered. If anyone in the audience has more questions, please uh, type them now. Otherwise, um, the time on the air is anyway coming to an end. And I thank you all for your interest and for um, participating in my presentation today and wish you all still a nice and interesting uh, bioconference. Thank you for your interest. Bye.